Father, we thank you for this opportunity to remember your deeds, and we pray that you would instruct us on how they point forward to the future. Lord, we ask that you would cause our hearts to be stirred up in love for you, for the gospel, for the Lord Jesus, for one another, and we pray that you would help us to trust you, to hope in you, to believe your mighty power. We pray that you would cause your word to have its way in our hearts and to do its work by the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. Recently, I listened to this novel called Dune. It's a, it's a science fiction story, and if I could put up a, a warning sign here that says, overstatement coming, okay, here's an overstatement coming your way. It's just knockoff Christianity, it's all it is. Um, the, the premise is you've got this desert planet, and there's no water. At least there aren't clouds and there isn't rain on this planet. And, and yet the people who inhabit this planet, they're looked at as though they're like the scum of the earth. They're, they're treated as though they're the, the offscourings and, and the nothings of the world. And um, through a, a, a course of events, an elaborate course of events, this Messiah figure comes, and he realizes that the people who inhabit this planet are actually geniuses. And this Messiah figure, this guy whose name is Paul, that's original, isn't it? Uh, he comes and he realizes that these geniuses are actually cultivating a way to, to cause water to, to be gathered on the surface of the earth. And then they've, they've engineered the environment so that they think that actually it's going to rain. And guess what? It's going to turn the planet into a Garden of Eden. It all happens scientifically. It all happens through purely human innovation. There is no God involved in any of these processes. Uh, I think the novel had such great appeal. It was a, it was a massively uh, best-selling science fiction novel. I think the novel had such great appeal precisely because of the way that it imitates the true story of the world. It imitates the story of the Bible. In the Bible, what you have is this place that was made good, that is cursed and, and bereft of God's blessing as a result of human sin, but then God is bringing about a, a redemption of this world, and God is going to be the one who brings about a, a renovation of the world and a recreation so that we're in a, a new kind of Garden of Eden. The psalm that we're engaging this morning, Psalm 105, is, is communicating this story, this true story of the world to us. I would invite you to open in your Bible to Psalm 105. If you didn't bring a Bible this morning, there's one in the pew in front of you. And if you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take that, that copy with you when you leave. Here's what I think is the main point of Psalm 105. Past salvation guarantees future deliverance. Past salvation. So the psalmist here is going to meditate on the exodus from Egypt. Past salvation guarantees, I could say future salvation, but I'll say future deliverance just for a little stylistic variation there. Past salvation guarantees future deliverance. And the reason, the reason this psalmist knows that there's going to be deliverance in the future is because of the promise that God made to Abraham. So the psalmist is going to meditate on God's promise to Abraham and the exodus from Egypt. Uh, this psalm is a, a poetic masterpiece, and it has an intricate structure. And there's a, there's a bulletin insert uh, where I've tried to lay out for you the, uh, the structure, and maybe that it would help you to follow along as we look at this psalm together uh, by looking at that bulletin insert, and that'll help you keep track of, of where we are. Before we look um, directly at Psalm 105, let me, let me just back out and tell you how I think in the, in the flow of thought that's developing in the Psalter, how this particular psalm is, is functioning and the message that it's, it's communicating. So we've been talking about how um, in the Psalms, at, at Psalm 89, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed and the king from David's line was dethroned. And the people of Israel, I think, were asking the question, are we going to continue to hope for a king from David's line to be the Messiah, to be the one who's going to bring about the renewal of the world. The, the, the promises to David were in jeopardy. 
And we've talked about how in Psalm 90, there's this prayer of Moses, and it's almost like Moses is doing for Israel in Psalm 90 what he did for Israel at Mount Sinai after the golden calf. You remember they had the golden calf, and God said, um, get out of my way, Moses. I'm going to destroy Israel and start all over with you. And Moses says, says, no, don't do that, Lord. Relent of your anger and turn from it. And now here's Moses in Psalm 90, verse 13, doing the same thing, saying, turn from your anger, Lord. Relent. Have pity on us. And then in the Psalms that follow, we have these reaffirmations of the promises to David. And then eventually we arrive at Psalm 103. And when we looked at that psalm, we talked about how it celebrates God's forgiveness. And then when we were together last time, we looked at Psalm 104, which celebrates creation. And I would draw your attention again to Psalm 104, verses 29 and 30, where in verse 29, we've got a reference to death and people and and animals returning to the dust. But then verse 30, you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. And here's, here's what I, I claimed about Psalm 104, and I would put this forward again. You can go be a Berean, think about this for yourself. I claimed that the meditation on creation in Psalm 104 is like the psalmist is saying, look, the creator of the world is definitely going to recreate the world. The, the one who created the world will renew the world. He started this project, he's going to finish the project. Man has ruined creation, defiled it, but God is going to cleanse it. That's what I think Psalm 104 is is claiming, where it sits. And that brings us to 105. And here's what I think the psalmist is saying in, in Psalm 105. He's saying something like this. When God made this covenant with Abraham, he promised that he would redeem the world. And then God, he, it's like he, he started acting on that promise at the exodus from Egypt. And that guarantees he's going to do it again. It guarantees a future salvation. It guarantees a new creation. I think that's the way that, that Psalm 105 is functioning here in the Psalter. And we're moving toward Psalm 110. Psalm 110, the most quoted psalm in the New Testament, which celebrates the triumph of David's greater son, the great king from David's line. And so I think there's a a flow of thought moving to that triumph and on into into the praise that God will win for himself when he redeems the world. So look with me, if you will, at at Psalm 105. And in the first seven verses, um, the the descendants of Abraham, look at verse 6, O offspring of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham, the offspring of Abraham are being summoned to praise God. Now, if I'm right about the flow of thought in the psalm, in the Psalms, and if I'm right that at this point it's like the people are in exile, they've been driven out of the land of promise, they've been taken captive by their neighbors, by their, their enemies, really, then we can say that the circumstances of these people's lives are not the way they would want them to be. And the psalmist here is not being insensitive. These are people who are suffering, they're in bondage, they're out of their homeland, and it may look to them like the promises of God are not coming to pass. They may not have a clear view of how the promises of God would come to pass. And look what the psalmist says to them in Psalm 105, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. He's talking to people who are in exile, in bondage, not seeing necessarily evidence that what God has said about them is going to come to pass. And he's calling them to give thanks in spite of their circumstances. Uh, Recently, I I was... I was um, listening to this novel called Ready Player One, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a novel that um, explores a, a virtual reality. It, it's like it's set in the future, and, and these people, they live, they live in the, their video games, and they enact their lives in their video games where they're all heroes. And, and this one character in the novel, he's, he made a true statement. He said, I know this. Nobody who lives in the real world gets everything that they want. Now, you're, you know, your circumstances may be worse than the people around you, but nobody who lives in the real world gets everything that they want. And the psalmist is saying to us, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. 
Okay, so they're in exile, they're among the peoples, and the psalmist is saying, brag about your God to these people who think that their gods have defeated your God. Verse 2, he continues, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Now, this language, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord, this is important language because back in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, Moses is talking about what's going to happen to Israel. And he's basically said in that passage, Deuteronomy 4, 25 through 31, he tells Israel, you're going to go into the land, you're going to break the covenant, you're going to be exiled. And then he says, but from there, from exile... You will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him when you search after him with all your hearts. And that's, what those, that's the terminology the psalmist is using here when he says, seek the Lord. He's, it's like he's saying, hey, exiles, remember what Moses said? Here we are in exile. Now it's time for us to seek the Lord and search after him with all our hearts. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And then verse 4, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. I like, I think the NAS has seek his face continually. If your circumstances are not what you want them to be, people in your life don't treat you the way you, they, you want them to treat you, or you're not having the success you were hoping for, you're not seeing the fruit that you'd like to see, the psalmist is saying to us, give thanks, sing praise, Seek the Lord. Seek the face of God. And then he just keeps saying this over and over in different ways. Verse 5. Remember the wondrous works that he has done. So if you were to ask me, how is it that I'm supposed to seek the Lord? I would just go through the other things he says here. Give thanks to him. Brag about his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Remember his wondrous works. And and you're going to get that stuff from the Bible. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles, verse 5, and the judgments that he uttered. And then he says in verse 6, O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. That last verse, verse 7, he is the Lord our God. It's like the psalmist is saying, he's the only God. And his rules, his decisions apply everywhere. And I would draw your attention to the end of this psalm. Look at verses 43 through 45. So on your, on your uh, bulletin insert, the opening section matches the ending section. And um, so this beginning call for the children of Abraham to praise, look down at verse, verses 43 through 45 at the end. It says, So he brought his people out. This is talking about the people that were brought out of Egypt. So he brought his people out with joy. His chosen ones. We just had a reference to the chosen ones back in verse 6. His chosen ones with singing. And he gave them the lands of the nations. Talking about the conquest of Canaan. And they took possession of the fruit of the people's toil. That they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. So... What do we have here? The the people that are in exile in verses 1 through 7 are being called to praise. That's matched by the end of the psalm where the psalmist is talking about the people who experienced the exodus and the conquest praised the Lord. And I think there's a, a logic here that says something like this. You people in exile are going to experience the new exodus and the return from exile. So trust the Lord and praise him. Look, look the way the people who experienced the exodus and the conquest of the land praised the Lord. They're your examples. So if you feel like you're in exile, you feel like you're in bondage, I would urge you to heed these commands given to you by this inspired psalmist and praise the Lord and seek his face. To help us do this, this psalmist has written the rest of this psalm. If we want to meditate on the works of the Lord, the psalmist is saying, here are some works of the Lord for you to meditate on. Look at verses 8 through 11, where the psalmist gives us reason to praise God. He says in verse 8, he, the Lord, remembers his covenant forever. 
And this is that, that promise to save the world that God made to Abraham. And, and all through verses 8 through 11, the psalmist is going to develop this covenant that God is going to remember forever. Now think about this. If God is going to remember the covenant forever, that means that until the end of the world, God is going to remember the promises that he made to Abraham. And, and the psalmist is saying, God is going to keep these promises that he's made to Abraham. He remembers his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for a thousand generations, that's a way for him to say, it's never going to expire. The word that God spoke to Abraham is never going to go out of date. We're never going to reach a place where the Lord says, oh, that, that promise is, is now uh, past its date and I am not going to keep it. No, he's going to remember this covenant forever. Then look at verse 9. He says, the covenant that he made with Abraham. Uh, literally, the text says that he cut this covenant with Abraham. And, and, and the cutting of the covenant refers to the way that Abraham cut these animals in pieces and spread them over apart from one another. And then you remember what happened? The presence of God passed between the pieces. Abraham didn't pass between the pieces. It was, it was the, the smoking fire pot and the flaming torch that represented God's own presence that passed between those pieces. And what the Lord was saying was, if I don't keep this covenant, let what has been done to these animals be done to me. The covenant that he cut with Abraham, verse 9, his sworn promise to Isaac. And what, what's being referred to here is the way that God said to Isaac in Genesis 26, he told him, he said to him in, in Genesis 26, verse 3, I will, give, I will give you all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. So God makes the covenant with Abraham, and then he says to Isaac, I'm going to establish that oath I made with Abraham with you. And then the psalmist continues in verse 10, which he confirmed to Jacob. And again, uh, in the same way that the covenant with Abraham was passed to Isaac, in Genesis 28, it was passed to Jacob. He confirmed to Jacob as a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, verse 11, to you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. Okay, so in the, in the promises to Abraham, uh, God has said, I'm going to give you this land. And that land represents the beachhead from which God is going to conquer the rest of the earth. So, so the promise about the land of Canaan is really an anticipation that God is going to rule over all the globe, all the world. Just as Paul says in Romans 4 that Abraham became an heir of the world. Notice how verse 8 says, he remembers his covenant forever. The corresponding statement down in verse 42 of this psalm says, he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. So at the beginning and the end, there's praise. And then the second piece and the second to last piece uh, is this, this development of the covenant with Abraham. And, and the pieces of this psalm are corresponding to one another because the psalmist is driving at a certain point. And, and we'll develop that point as we, as we continue here. Look at verse 12. We move into this section on, on the way that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were moving about in the land of promise. Verse 12, the psalmist says, When they were few in number, of little account, and sojourners in the land, in that promise, the land that was promised to them, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people. So what the psalmist is saying is, is something like this. God said to Abraham and his children, you're going to own this land. And then their whole lives, they didn't own the land. God said to Abraham and his, his children, this is your land. And then for the duration of their existence, it was owned by other kingdoms and other peoples. And any piece of it they wanted, they had to buy because it didn't belong to them. They're wandering around from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people. And yet, even though they don't look impressive... Even though they don't own the land, look at verse 14, he allowed no one to oppress them. So I think what he has in mind here is the way that at, at various points, 
Uh, you remember Abraham would tell these lies about Sarah and say, she's my sister, and, and first Pharaoh, and then Abimelech seizes uh, Sarah, and the Lord doesn't allow that oppression to, to continue. He afflicts the house of Pharaoh. Pharaoh gives her back. He afflicts uh, Abimelech. Abimelech gives her back, and then Isaac does the same thing. Isaac uh, says that his wife, Rebekah, is his sister. She's seized by a foreign king. The Lord afflicts that king, and uh, the king gives, gives Isaac his wife back. The Lord allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account. So, so the Lord is protecting his people. He's rebuking these foreign powers. And then verse 15 is interesting. It says, saying, touch not my anointed ones. That word anointed ones, you could translate that messiahs. Don't touch my messiahs. And the reason this is interesting is because Abraham and Isaac are not referred to as messiahs in the book of Genesis. Abraham is called a prophet. The rest of the verse says, do my prophets no harm. Uh, the Lord tells Abimelech that Abraham's a prophet. He'll pray for you. But I think what's happening here is that the psalmist is aligning Abraham and Isaac with, with people like David, the anointed of the Lord, and the promised one in, in uh, Psalm 2, when uh, this, this prophecy from 2 Samuel 7 is reiterated about how the Lord is going to raise up the descendant of David and set him on the throne and give him the nations as his inheritance, right? And so it's like, it's like Abraham and Isaac are anticipating the one who's going to inherit all the earth. So there's this, this contemplation of the patriarchs who didn't possess the homeland. There's a corresponding section down in verses 39 through 41. Look at that. Verse 39, speaking of the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt, the psalmist says, he spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light by night. He may be talking about the pillar of fire that led the people in the night through the wilderness and the pillar of cloud by day. He may have in mind that occasion when Israel comes out of Egypt and they get to the, to the Red Sea and here comes the army of Pharaoh. And, and this, this fiery cloud and pillar moves from being in front of Israel to being behind them, keeping Israel and Egypt separate all night. The point is, God is leading his people and providing for his people. And then look at verse 40. They asked, and he brought quail, and gave them bread from heaven in abundance. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. So obviously, the, the way the Lord provided food and drink for Israel in the wilderness. Now, in the psalm, that section on the way that, that God provided for Israel in the wilderness, I'm suggesting to you, is poetically structured to correspond to the way that the patriarchs did not inhabit the land. Let's think together about what this might imply. Here, here's what I would suggest. When you are not realizing the fulfillment of God's promises, God is protecting you and providing for you. God was protecting the patriarchs and, and not allowing foreign kings to oppress them. God was protecting the people of Israel who had come out of Egypt and, and providing manna from heaven and water from the rock for them. And, and you in your life, you, you may be uh, claiming some promise of God. You may be uh, thinking in terms of the Lord promising victory over some sin in your life. You may be thinking in terms of the Lord promising that his disciples are going to bear fruit and you're faithfully sharing the gospel and you're not seeing any fruit. I don't know what your circumstances may entail. You may have, you may have your hopes fixed on something that God has not promised to do for you. And if that's the problem, I would urge you to reorient your hopes and, and you need to fix your hopes on what God has promised because these other things that God has not promised to you, that's only going to lead you to despair. But as you wait for God to keep his word, I think the psalmist is saying, look at the way that God provided for people who were in your position. Look at the way that God protected people who were in your position. And before we draw the conclusion, God has abandoned me. God is not going to keep his word in my life. We, we must look at these people and see how the Lord protected them and provided for them. 
Next, we've got verses 16 through 23, where Israel descended into Egypt. And this is, I think this is fascinating, the way the psalmist orchestrates this. He, he matches the story of their descent into Egypt with the exodus from Egypt. And then there's a middle section in verses 24 and 25 about how Israel was, was multiplying and then became hated in Egypt. So let's look at, at verses 16 through 23 here. The psalmist says, When he summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread. Now, th- this is, th- let, me, let, me, let me remind you of the course of events in Genesis 37 through 50 so that we can get our heads around, around what the psalmist is doing here. At the end of that story, over in Genesis chapter 50, Joseph is able to look back and say to his brothers, you meant this for evil, God meant this for good. And, and the story begins with Joseph having these dreams, and then as a result of his dreams, uh, his brothers are jealous of him, they hate him, they want to get rid of him, and so they sell him into slavery. And Joseph is taken down into slavery in Egypt. He first has dreams in prison, uh, well, sorry, first he's with Potiphar, Potiphar's wife makes these false accusations about him. He winds up in prison as a result of those false accusations, uh, which is if you put yourself in Joseph's place, God, you made these promises about how my brothers are going to bow down to me, and now here I am rotting in jail for something I didn't do to, to, to the master's wife. So he's there in prison, and then he's there with the, the baker and the cupbearer, you remember, and they have these dreams, and then one of them loses his head, and the other gets exalted, and then Pharaoh finally has a dream, right? Pharaoh dreams of these seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of plant famine, but he doesn't understand the dreams. And, and the guy that got out, he hears this dream, and he's like, hey, there's a guy down there in jail that can interpret this dream for you. And, and Joseph explains that dream is about these seven coming years of famine. That's what the psalmist is talking about here in verse 16, when he summoned a famine on the land. Because that's the famine that results in Jacob up there in the land of promise saying to his sons, why are you sitting here looking at one another? There's there's bread down in Egypt. Go down to Egypt and get bread for us. When he summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread, verse 17, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who who was sold as a slave. Do you see what just happened there? The psalmist is, is interpreting the whole story in light of Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Joseph being in slavery in Egypt, the psalmist is saying, God sent him ahead of his brothers, sold as a slave. I can't interpret all of your circumstances. I can't interpret all of your suffering for you. But look at verse 18. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass. I think that's, that could be either talking about Joseph's dreams, his prophecies coming to pass, or it could be talking about the Lord's decreed will for Joseph coming to pass. But then look at the end of verse 19. The word of the Lord tested him. And this is the kind of testing that's that refining, purifying testing. The psalmist is saying to people, waiting on the fulfillment of God's promises, which is where we all are. We're all waiting for the resurrection of the dead and the opportunity to enter into a glorified existence in a new heavens and new earth. And the psalmist is saying to us, God is testing you. God is refining your faith. God is honing you, trying to make you a better person through your suffering. God has you exactly where he wants you. And then once it's come to pass, verse 20, the king sent and released him. The ruler of the peoples set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of his possessions. And then there's this kind of reversal where the one who was bound, the one who was in in, in a collar of iron and in fetters, he now has the opportunity in verse 22 to bind the princes of Pharaoh at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. And then after that course of events, Israel, his father, Joseph's father, Jacob, came to Egypt. Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. So that whole section there, verses 16 through 23, is focused on how Joseph played this crucial role in God's purposes as Israel came into Egypt. Let's look at the corresponding section 
in verses 26 through uh, 38, and, and we'll move through this relatively quickly. Verse 26, he sent Moses. Look back at verse 17. He had sent a man, Joseph. He sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. It's, it's like the role that Joseph played in Israel going into Egypt corresponds to the role that Moses and Aaron play in Israel coming out of Egypt. He sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. They performed his signs among them and miracles in the land of Ham. I think he has in mind the way that when Moses and Aaron first come to the Israelites and they've got the staff that becomes a snake and then the staff eats all the snakes of Pharaoh whose magicians had done the same thing. They performed his signs among them and miracles in the land of Ham. Verse 28. Now, what, what's going to happen here in verses 28 through 36 or so is the psalmist is going to rehearse the ten plagues. <clears throat> but he's going he's to put them in a different order than they are in the text. Instead of going one through ten, he goes nine, one, two, three, seven, eight, and ten. And I think he's just doing a quick summary, maybe... Um, there, there may be a logic to the order. If so, I, I haven't teased that out yet. I don't know what that would be. But at any rate, uh, that's the order. But here's what we can't miss from this rehearsal of the plagues on Egypt. These plagues demonstrate God's superiority, the God of the Bible's superiority over the gods of Egypt. These plagues demonstrate the power of the God of the Bible who is active in the world today. These plagues show God's power to keep the covenant that he made with Abraham. These plagues remind the exiles that God has the power to liberate them. So verse, I'm just going to read through these. Verse 28, he sent darkness and made the land dark. They did not rebel against his words. I think he's talking about the, the darkness didn't rebel against God's words. He turned their waters into blood and caused their fish to die. Their land swarmed with frogs, even in the chambers of their kings. He spoke, and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout all their country. He gave them hail for rain and fiery lightning bolts through their land. He struck down their vines and fig trees and shattered the trees of their country. He spoke, and the locusts came, young locusts without number, which devoured all the vegetation in their land and ate up the fruit of their ground. He struck down, this is the tenth plague, all the firstborn in their land, the first fruits of all their strength. So it was through the Passover where the blood of the lamb was placed over the lintel of the doorways of the Israelites that they were delivered, right? And then all the firstborn of Egypt were struck down because they did not have that blood over the doorway of their homes. And of course, that salvation is pointing forward to the way that God is going to accomplish salvation in Jesus, right? The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. And so you may look at this and you may say to yourself, um, all the firstborn of Egypt died? That's right. The God who created has the right to take away life. All people are obligated to him. And it is, the only, it is only those who trust the Lord and, and whose, whose life in response to what he has commanded shows that they trust, right? So because they believe what Moses said to them, they slaughter the lamb, they put the blood over the, over the doorpost, and the angel of death passes over them. The same way, people who hear the message of, of Christ crucified for sinners and say, I want that blood to cover my sins, and then they respond with a life that shows that they believe that message. People who repent of their sins and believe, they, they are the ones who are delivered. And just as Israel is brought out of Egypt, uh, those who trust this message are going to be brought out of this bondage to, cap bondage to corruption into uh, a new and better land of promise. So if you're here today and you're not a believer, we would call you to faith in Jesus. We would call you to do the Christian equivalent of putting the lamb, the, pas the lamb of the, of the Passover uh, slain over the doorpost to your house. You need to, you need to turn from all the stuff that shows that you're in re rebellion against God and hope fully in the Lord Jesus. 
And then verse 37 speaks of the way that the Israelites plundered the Egyptians. He brought out Israel with silver and gold, and there was none among his tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon it, fallen upon Egypt. Uh, so that, that, that rehearsal of the exodus from Egypt is here, I think, and this, this psalm is structured the way that it is to say to the exiles, God kept the covenant with Abraham at the exodus uh, from Egypt. And that covenant with Abraham is an everlasting covenant. So God is certainly going to accomplish this new exodus and bring you back to the land of promise, which he did. You can read about it in the book of Ezra. Uh, the, the exiles were liberated from Babylon in the same way that the Egyptians had funded the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness. The king of Persia, Cyrus, funded the Israelites to go back to the land and rebuild the temple. But then the, the real fulfillment of this is in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the death and resurrection of Jesus is the fulfillment of, of the Passover. It's the fulfillment of the prophesied new exodus. And it's opening a way so that we today are like those wandering uh, Israelites moving through the wilderness, being su sustained by bread from heaven and water from the rock. And, and we're making our way to a new and better land of Canaan, there's a new Jerusalem that's going to descend from God out of heaven, and, and God is going to remake the world, just as we saw in Psalm 104, and, and we will enter into a new heaven and new earth in glorified bodies to enjoy the goodness of God forever. So whatever your circumstances are right now, the psalmist is calling you to give thanks to the Lord. The psalmist is calling you to praise the Lord. God is at work in, in orchestrating this vast and elaborate plan. Look at verses 24 and 25, the middle of the psalm, the only thing we haven't looked at here. The Lord made his people very fruitful and made them stronger than their foes. You remember how in, in the opening verses of Exodus, the people of Israel were fruitful and multiplied greatly, and the text says the land was full of them. That, that verse resonates with Genesis 1.28, where God said to, Ab to Adam, he blessed him and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And it's like in Egypt, God is bringing this about through the multiplication of the people of, of Israel. And then look at verse 25. He turned their hearts to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. God made the, the Egyptians deal craftily with the Israelites. Why? Because God is orchestrating this grand plan. You're living in a better science fiction story than Dune. You're living in the cosmic plan of the great novelist, and you get a speaking part. The question is, will you trust the author? Will you place your hopes, will you place your hopes where the Lord will bring to pass what you long for? Um, several years ago, my kids and I, we memorized this, this poem that well illustrates falsely placed hopes. Maybe you've heard this poem, Casey at the Bat. This is a contrast with, um, with those who place their hopes in the Lord. Now, I'm not going to read through this whole poem. I'm tempted to. I'm not going to read through the whole poem. I'll just remind you of its contents. I'm, I'm sure you've heard it at some point. Uh, there, there, there's... Uh, there's this ball game going on in Mudville, and the outlook doesn't, is, isn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine because uh, they've got the losers coming up to the plate, the guys that they don't expect to hit, and they're, and they're behind on the, on the scoreboard. And so people are leaving, and, and people are giving up hope, but then these, these people that they don't expect to hit, they get on base, and the next thing you know, there are runners at second and third, and Casey is at the bat. And, and Casey is all proud and strong, and the crowd is going wild because, because on the basis of Casey's past performance, they expect him to do a future deliverance. And I, and I will uh, read these closing stanzas. Um, with a smile of Christian charity which really, he's not a Christian, but anyway. Great, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult. He bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the spheroid flew. But Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, strike two. Fraud, cried the maddened thousands, and Echo answered fraud. 
But one scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscle strain, and they knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball. And now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere. And somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. You place your hopes in the wrong deliverer. You place your hopes in the wrong place, and you're going to be like the inhabitants of Mudville, lamenting the way that your hero has failed you. But if you place your hopes in the Lord, if you place your hope and trust in the Lord, and you heed this psalmist, and you rejoice in God, whatever your circumstances, and you train your heart to remember the words of the Lord, and you train your appetites. I mentioned this last week. The way that we have to train our appetites is the way that we acquire a taste for coffee, right? Everybody that drinks a cup of coffee for the first time, I think, thinks that's a bitter, nasty brew. But you keep drinking this stuff, and you come to love the taste of it. You come to need it. You come to want it first thing in the morning. You look forward to it. Later in the day, you know, you catch a whiff whiff of those beans, and you think, I can't wait until tomorrow morning when I get to drink my coffee again. This is the way that the promises of God work in our hearts. This is the way that we train our appetites to love the Bible. We, we come to this initially and we think, this is a difficult book. And I don't know that I'm getting much out of this. But you stay at it. You stay at it and before long, in the middle of the day, you hear a, 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 a refrain of a Bible verse and you're thinking to yourself, I can't wait to spend time with the Lord tomorrow morning. And you train your appetites, and you need it, and you love it, and you begin to hope in the Lord, and your whole life is transformed. And this, this hero, this champion, will not fail you. He will not let you down. He will certainly raise the dead. He will bring to pass the new exodus, the fulfillment of it. He will, he will bring the new Jerusalem down from heaven, and his people will be like these who took the land at the end of this psalm. He brought his people out with joy, his chosen ones with singing, and they took possession of the fruit of the people's toil that they might keep his statutes and ob observe his laws. We will obey because we want to obey, because we rejoice in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the care and the artistry of this psalmist. We thank you for the way that he loved you and the way that he reflected on your mighty deeds. We thank you for his encouragement. And Lord, we pray that you would fix our hearts on what you've said you will do. We pray that you would cause us to be swept up in this true story of the world. Help us to find our identity in the story the Bible is telling. Help us to think of ourselves as your people making our way through the wilderness to the new and better land of promise, redeemed from slavery to sin through the Lord Jesus, provided with, with the Holy Spirit, which is better than water from the rock. And Lord, we ask that you would hereby enable us to live lives that are pleasing to you, lives that are free from the love of the world and free from um, all the things that would ensnare us. Lord, help us to make our way home. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.